waiting. Abuna, if you want to start. Yep, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We just start with a short prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for this opportunity that we gather together. And we ask, Lord, that you guide us in our life always, that you guide our steps. And that today's session may be edifying and, and food for thought for all of us. We ask you, Lord, dear Lord, to bless your children and guide them in every step of their life. Hear us as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For Jesus Christ, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God. Amen. Oops. Abuna, do you want to do a quick introduction before Mina? Sure. I know you're very keen, Mina, but we'll start with Abuna. Short introduction. No, no, no. That's all right. I don't talk much. So um, I'm going to mute myself. I think um, I just want to start uh, by welcoming you all and um, thanking the, those who will be presenting today. It's I think it's a really important uh, initiative to to hear from experts from different areas about their careers um, as you embark on this major decision in your life. It is a major decision um, and something that needs a lot of thought, uh, prayer, and consideration. Um, in deciding the direction of your life. And there's a beautiful verse that I'd like to start with from Proverbs 16, uh, verse 9, which says that a, man, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And we really pray, um, and, I, and I really encourage you to pray that, that God will direct every step of your life. Um, and we believe that God is interested even in these kind of decisions. Although it may not seem like a spiritual decision, um, God is interested in our life and he's interested in guiding our steps, especially the, the big decisions like our career. Um, so I thought just by before going into the different careers that you'll hear about today, um, just to provide a couple of um, guiding principles think about when you're trying to decide about your career um, the first thing i think we should mention is that what does god want you to do um, what job does god want you to do what profession does he want you to be um, i think to answer that question is god doesn't really mind you know he doesn't mind if you're going to be a teacher or a lawyer or a doctor or a pharmacist or a plumber he, he really doesn't um, God wants you to be successful. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to have a good relationship with him. He wants you to fulfill your mission in this world of being ambassador of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is what God wants from you. Um, so God will, will guide you in this decision um, and he will encourage you and support you in what you want to do. Um, so it's not like God has the secret answer to what I need to be to figure it out from him it's trying to look at, at other um, guiding um, aspects to guide me in what i should be doing so i want to share with you a couple of these guiding principles that i think may help um, there's only four of them so if you want you can um, drop them down um, the first guiding principle is align your career to your god-given talents and interests yeah. align your career to your God-given talents and interests, um, almost playing to your strengths. You know, each of us are unique. We're all created differently and we all have different talents and interests. Um, I may be passionate about something. Uh, you may not be passionate about the same thing. So align yourself to what you love, um, what you're good at. Yeah. Um, that's the thing. First one. The second is just ensure that it's practical providing a living. Yeah. Um, I may be interested, for example, in um, I may be interested interested in fish, for example. 
but maybe I can't figure out a career that will provide me a living uh, if all I do is study fish. Um, maybe there is, I don't know. But the, the concept is, it's not just what I'm interested in, what I'm passionate about, but it also needs to be a practical, that it, it, there are jobs available. There is a career pathway for me to make a living, to provide for a family, to, to earn an income. Um, so, so just to ensure that it's a practical, um, it's practical in providing a living. Yeah, there is demand for this particular career. Um, the third is consider this career's potential beyond just being an employee. Yeah, consider the career's potential beyond just being an employee. Uh, why I say that is because sometimes we uh, uh, stick to what we are used to. Um, what our parents have been doing is that we have a particular job and we remain as an employee our whole life. Um, and that's, that's about it. But it's also exciting to consider establishing your own business, um, establishing your own company, working for yourself, hiring, uh, building something from scratch um, with more, not just but also to satisfaction that you've edited something, you've, you've contributed having that can be helpful. Does this really potentially allow me to own my own business or work for myself? Um, so consider that, uh, does it have potential just being an employee? The fourth guiding principle is how can I use this to, for the glory of God? Yeah, I think uh, ultimately everything we do needs to be done for the glory of God. And so when we think, if I do this particular career, um, I could contribute to the service of the particular way. Um, I could help the, in, in this way. So how are you doing? Abuna, you're breaking up. The Sorry first principle aligned with Abuna, you're breaking up. Is that better? We missed half the fourth um, uh, uh, guideline. The fourth was. Um, how can I use it for the glory of God? Yeah, so that everything that you do is done for the glory of God. And you can think about how you can use this career uh, for the church or for serving others. Thank you so much, Mimi. Thank you all of you for, for being with us. And um, God guide all of you. Thank you, Abuna. Thank you very much. Abuna, put all your guidelines on the chat so the kids can get them. Thank you. No worries. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Abuna. Bye. Okay, um, we're like going to start, we're gonna start <laughs> with the first um, talk. Uh, so uh, Mina Hanna has joined us to talk about um, a career in legal. Uh, uh, Mina? Yeah, thanks, Mimi. So uh, when Mimi contacted me, she said the most important career is to be done first. And then the least important career will be done at the end of tomorrow. And I see that Adil Magdi is talking about medicine at the end of the day tomorrow. So thanks, Mimi, for getting your priorities right. Um, this presentation is about a, a career in the law. Um, and I know there are a number of lawyers already from the Coptic community who are, have embarked on this career, and it's fairly exciting. Um, I've only got 15 minutes, so I'll get started. Most people who want to be a lawyer want to do so because of, you know, they watch a program like Suits or Law and Order and they think it's, it's great and exciting and there's a lot of uh, bantering and a lot of, you know, uh, politics involved. Um, it's not as exciting as what you see on this screen. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if you see on the, on the far left side what I actually do, and that's usually covered in, in loads of paper and, and reading. So the law... Um, is not exactly what you see on TV. It's not about just the courtroom drama. It's not just about, you know, wearing high-powered suits and, 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 and 
you know, fighting with, with a judge. Um, there's a lot more involved uh, to being a lawyer. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll get an idea as to whether this is a career that, that you'd be interested in. So what is a lawyer? So there's, lawyers are multifaceted. So there's a lot of there's a lot of roles for lawyers. So you you advocate for people either in court or outside of court. Um, you represent your clients and advise them when they're in trouble. Um, it can range from a whole heap of things. If you're acting for a corporate and in a big law firm, you know you may be advising Coca-Cola or Woolworths or Coles on a on an acquisition of a, of a big company, or it could be a slip and fall, it could be uh, negotiating contracts for supply routes of their, their products. Um, we help solve problems. So a lot of clients would come to us um, if they find themselves in a legal pickle, they're either in trouble with the police or they're in trouble with the business that they're running or, they, or they're in trouble you know, generally um, if they've entered a business transaction which they're not happy with. Um, we also advise them so we can help clients set up businesses. We can advise clients and help them purchase properties. Um, so as a lawyer, you have to be a good communicator. You need to be able to communicate very clearly. You need to be very empathetic and understands people's emotions, especially if you're going to practice in a field like family law, where there's a lot of, you know, if there's divorce or child custody arrangements or whatever, you need to have... Um, a lot of empathy to deal with, with, with clients that, that come to you in those kinds of predicament. Um, we also act in criminal jurisdictions. So if your client has been charged with a criminal offence, um, that's probably the, the most exciting area of law is the, the criminal defence part of it. Um, you can also do civil law. Civil law is where there's just a dispute between two parties in relation to a contract or a boundary dispute or an unpaid bill or something. Um, you'll also hear lawyers referred to as attorneys, solicitors, advocates, um, or the more serious advocates, a step up from a lawyer is, is known as a barrister, which in, requires further um, study after you've worked for a while as a solicitor. Um, when you become a solicitor, you're licensed by the state in which you've got your degree. So for me, I'm licensed in New South Wales, so I can engage in all uh, legal processes here in New South Wales, but I can't, for example, act in Queensland or Victoria um, unless it's a high court matter in which I can act. So lots of skills. So obviously in high school, um, high school is not really a great platform for you to know what your skills are because the skills of a lawyer are actually developed over time. So a lot of the skills that you're gonna read on this slide you might look at and say, well, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. That's fine because the skills of a lawyer are acquired over time. You develop skills when you're going through law school uh, and more importantly, you develop skills when you start work and start working in a field that you feel comfortable in. So some people come out of law school and decide to specialise in criminal law. So maybe for the first few times that you appear before a judge, you feel like you're going to throw up or you don't know what you're doing or you're a bit confused. But as you develop your confidence and your skill set in that area of law, a lot of these skills that you see on this screen will come to you fairly naturally. So even though right now you'd be looking at this and saying, well, you know, reading copious amounts of books is not for me or reading a 300-page judgment is not for me or standing in front of a, a judge, I hate debating, I don't want to stand in front of a judge and, and put together a, a submission, that changes. So you, your school skill set is really, really hasn't developed fully by the time you've left school. But as you go through university and you go through work, you'll find that your skills will develop over time. Um, so some skills here that I can quickly touch on, um, you need to be someone who, who can be fairly confident, um, someone who can be fairly confident in speaking publicly, um, someone who's keen on, on reading and absorbing knowledge. Um, the law is all about analysis. So if you've picked subjects at school or you're good at English or you're good at history, history requires a lot of analysis. Uh, economics requires a lot of analysis. If you've picked up the skill of analysis, um, as part of your course, that will help you greatly as you develop through your legal um, career. 
um, only because you'll be reading a law and you'll be trying to get your client out of a particular predicament. And the only way you can get them out of that predicament is if you um, analyze the law and find a particular loophole or a particular way in which you can get them out of trouble. So analysis, critical thinking is quite important. You don't, don't accept anything that you hear. Um, you challenge it, you look for evidence, you dig further. So you've got to be fairly patient as well. Um, and you should be fairly passionate as well about being honest and having integrity in all that you do. So the law, a lot of people say to me, so do you have to lie if you're going to be a lawyer? And the answer is no. In fact, it's the opposite. You're not allowed to lie. You're an officer of the court. You're an officer of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Um, if you're caught lying, there's a serious impact uh, on your career. So as a lawyer, you don't lie. You simply tell the truth and find the evidence to back up what you're saying. Um, you know, developing writing skills, that's something you should be doing now and, and hopefully harnessing in the future. Uh, researching, you know, using different research tools. Again, they teach you those kinds of skills at uni in terms of legal skills and legal resources that are available to you. As long as you have the, the, the stamina and the will to represent people and help them through their problems, then these skill sets will come to you naturally. Next, where lawyers work. Right, so lawyers don't just work in the courtroom. So this is a, a, an image of the courtroom. Courtroom is probably only, you know, depending on what area of law you end up in, it's probably five, 10% of where you'll end up being for most of your legal career, unless you're a professional barrister or a professional litigator. And being in the courtroom is not a big part of your duty. Um, if you work in private practice, um, if you're lucky enough, you'll get to work in some of the big firms in Australia, like the Mallisons or the Fate Utes, and a lot of international law firms have now opened up in Australia. And the benefit of working in a big practice is that you get to work on big matters with high profile clients and, and you get your teeth cut into some serious, um, serious skills that you learn very early on. Um, you can also work in small private practices, which help mums and dads and, and deal with day-to-day -day problems that, that they may have and, and, and also small businesses. Um, lawyers also tend to work a lot in government agencies. So the Attorney General's department is full of lawyers. It's the highest legal department in the land. Um, people like to work in governments for, for many reasons. It's a bit more laid back, but at the same time, your skills are very, um, very movable, very malleable. Um, so you can work across local, state and federal governments um, as a lawyer or using your legal skills in different divisions. Um, you can work in banks, in-house legal. Uh, you can work in large corporations as an in-house lawyer. Um, I started my career at the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions, where I was a public prosecutor for about three years. Uh, it was my job to prosecute murderers and drug dealers and all sorts of fun things, but I didn't last long in that for obvious reasons. It, it gets quite um, confronting at times. Um, you can work as a lecturer at uni, lecturing in, in, in the legal field, Whatever, whatever field is available within the tertiary education system. And if you're senior enough and you get through, you know, a good 20 years or 30 years of, of litigation, there is a, an obvious um, career path as a judge. Again, it's, it's very far and few between, but if that's something that tickles your fancy, that's always there as an option. Becoming a lawyer, um, the main way of doing it is, is by going to university. Um, I know it's fairly competitive, so if you wanted to get into the Sydney or New South Wales or UTS, I think the cutoff mark is around the 98s or 99s. I know that's fairly aggressive. Um, I know a lot of other universities now have opened up legal faculties, which are probably a lot more achievable, which is good. Um, most, most of your bachelor degrees with law is a combined law degree, so you don't just do straight law anymore. You'd be doing a law, a combined arts law, combined commerce law, combined science law. Basically, it's a five-year course uh, where you do a bit of law and a bit of science or economics. Um, and then after three years, you graduate from your first degree. Then two years later, you graduate from your law degree. Uh, and during that time, it's well advised that you start practicing in law firms and getting experience in community legal practices, whatever, just to try and build up your skill set. After you complete your law degree, there is a six-month 
College of Law course, which is called the Practical Legal Training course, which is again, another set of exams and practical training, uh, after which time you get your, your legal certificate and you're officially a solicitor. Um, there is a part-time option uh, for study called the Legal Profession Admission Board, the LPAB, which is night courses over a period of, I think, of about three to four years, uh, where you just do straight law. A lot of specialty areas. Um, I've put some uh, screenshots of when I used to do media. So that's another area. Once you, um, once you prove yourself in your area, then the media will always come knocking on your door, asking you for your opinions. And I did this for about two years, which was, again, quite exciting. Shows you how diverse the legal uh, industry can take you. Areas of law are diverse. On the right-hand side there, you can either go family law, international, or tax law, employment, real estate, prosecutors, corporate. There's a whole world of law out there. There's, there's not one size fits all. As you go through law school, you're going to be exposed to a number of these areas of law. And one or two of them might tickle your fancy and you might want to pursue those later on in life. So it is actually a, a huge area uh, of law. As I said, presenting in court or doing advocacy work is really a small percentage of what you see here. And that's it. Okay. You can take, you take questions at the end, very, very yes. end. Yeah, we'll take questions at the end if you don't mind, because we don't know how long each session will be. Um, Yes. So, uh, guys, I've put also the program for the day today on um, uh, on the chat. So um, we're going to cover uh, four sessions today. We've done law. We're going to do teaching um, and childcare. Then uh, we're doing data and analytics and actuarial studies. And finally, today we'll do IT. Um, and then um, we'll have time for questions at the end. You can start typing your questions. Uh, if you have them uh, on the chat, because then we can direct them to the right person and they can read your questions to prepare for answers. Um, and also we're recording, so we'll send the whole session um, out on WhatsApp uh, to everybody. Um, but please feel free to type in your questions now. Um, so we'll move to Sherry and Sylvia uh, for the teaching and childcare. Sherry, you'll start with teaching. You're on mute. I do this all the time in class. What are you talking about? I talk to myself <laughs> a lot in class. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I'm actually head of department and I, um, I work with the Department of Education. But for me, I'm going to go back to something I Buddha said, actually. He said, you've got to do something that fits your strengths. I actually applied to be a pharmacist at uni and I, um, I also I changed it. And... Also, the other thing is, is I actually got accepted to Sydney Uni and I changed it. I stayed at Western Sydney and, and because I stayed at Western Sydney, I actually met my husband, George, and I think some of you have got my son as your Sunday school teacher. So, you know, God does work in mysterious ways and, you know, I'm blessed now to be working with Mina in education um, with the Coptic schools. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of these things that really it is very, very diverse. Okay. So for me, I think it's the most rewarding career. Um, those that know my family, we are all teachers. Okay, because we absolutely love the teaching. My mum and my dad are teachers. My sisters are teachers. My son is a teacher, Chris. Okay, so we are a family of teachers and we absolutely love it. Why? Because it's very, very rewarding. Um, so I'm going to say what's it all about. Basically, basically, it's laying the foundations of life from childcare, which Sylvia will talk about, through all the way through to year 12 and possibly and tertiary. Okay, but I'm talking about primary, secondary teaching here. We're a role model. We are role models to to students from all ages um, and that's part of our life and you know what we live is what we do and what we breathe um, you know we model the students into lifelong learners now you all you're all students so you will know that you know you learn everything something every new something new every single day and you know and you be, you're, you yourself become um, a lifelong learner yourself so I'm always learning um, I'm you know there's so much I'm learning all the time and you know as you, as you get older, you sort of understand that you're, you don't know it all. And there are so many changes, as we know, guys, and, you know, I feel for you all um, at school at the moment, that you are the ones that are going to be, you know, you, you, have to ha you have to cope with the change and teachers cope with the change too and be, therefore we learn. And I, I, should, I put this one in, on, in pur on purpose in the slide. Okay, remember, you are the ones who will be developing and teaching all those doctors 
pharmacists, engineers, and lawyers. Okay, the teachers are what lay, lay the foundations of life. And you know, don't let anyone say to you that it's not worth doing. It is one of the best professions, seriously, you can actually do. Um, okay, well, so I'm going to talk about primary, and secondary teaching. All right, do you need to go to university? Absolutely. All right, absolutely, you need to go to university to do it. Why? Because you need to learn the research behind the teaching. Teaching isn't just going into a classroom and saying, hey, you know, I know, look, some of you might think, oh, my God, my teacher, you know, doesn't know. Mm -hmm. But you know what? They went to uni and, you know, sometimes there are some, and I'm going to be honest with you, it's not as easy as people think. It is not an easy job. It is changing all the time and it is very, very demanding, especially at the moment. Okay? But you need to learn the research of what, how you teach and why you teach. You need to realise that you become an educator, not a teacher. So you're there to educate, not just like there's a difference, okay? Educating somebody is teaching them just lifelong skills as well. So as a teacher, you're a teacher or educator, counsellor, parent, um, you know, someone who supports, um, you know, canteen. You do all that sort of stuff, okay? And the reason why you need to go to uni is because you need to practice, okay? You can't just go into a classroom. I'll tell you straight out now. Um, you can't go into a classroom without the practice, without the knowledge of what to actually do. So you really need to do the practice for it. Um, okay, so there's a salary career progression. I was asked to put this in here, so I'm putting it in. Okay, so you first start with a beginning teacher. The beginning teacher salary is actually $75,000. Now, this is based on the Department of Education, okay, not the private schools. Okay, then you become a senior classroom teacher, so the top of the, top of the scale. Head of department, deputy principal, and principal of a large school or a principal. Now, these are pretty competitive across all schools, okay, but these are Department of Education ones. So, realistically, it's, it's the I mean, people say, oh, you know, they, you don't earn much as a teacher, but you know what? Money's not everything, and you do earn quite a bit, okay? It is quite a good salary, all right? And it is a rewarding salary. If you don't love what you do and you earn millions of mon dollars of money, well, you know, you really need to learn, you need to love what you do. And personally, I love what I do. Okay, I absolutely do love what I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. Okay, advantages. There were so many to choose from, guys. And I chose six. Okay, job security. In, in, at the moment, we are so much in short of teachers. And I'm pretty sure childcare as well. Okay, we are very short in teaching. Um, you're bound to get a job. I'll give you an example of Christopher, my son. He graduated last year. Before he even started the new year, he had a job in a private school, in a Catholic school permanent. Okay. Whereas some people are waiting, you know, years for a job in teaching, it's there. We are, need, we are needing teachers, primary school teachers, high school teachers in every single faculty. So, you know, whether you're an English teacher, maths teacher, science teacher, hissy teacher, it doesn't matter. You are needed. So you need to be able to do it. You actually get a family life. Okay. You get a family life with, when you're a teacher both men and women, okay, you do get family life. Um, you know, I love the fact, yes, I do have 12 weeks holiday a year, but I can tell you I don't actually do have 12 weeks, okay. I, I will work on the holidays. I'll work, um, you know, during, you know, mark assignments and exams. However, it's not as like you only got four weeks a year, like every other job, you have 12. But you are your own person. Okay, you have that flexibility of being yourself in the classroom. You don't have to be somebody else, and you move. It moves with the future. So I'll give you an example. When I first started teaching, I had a blackboard. When I started teaching, it was a blackboard. Most of you don't even know what a blackboard is, but there's a blackboard. Okay, and you will also. And now you know my new school, or where I am at the moment. Sorry, my new the new building is coming up is actually writable TVs, as an example. Okay, so we do move with the future with the technologies there and we love what we do, okay? If you love what you do, it won't matter to you, okay? You gotta understand that. It's, it's very, very important. And this one, I'm just gonna say to you now, I couldn't find any disadvantages. I had to think, I actually rang my mum and my dad and my son, Christopher and my sisters. I said, what are the disadvantages of teaching? Not one of us could actually find one. So I'm just letting you know, you know I'm very passionate about teaching. And um, I love what I do. And I've been doing it for 25 years plus. And I would encourage anybody who actually likes dealing with kids and teenagers that this is the job for you. Okay, I'm going to pass over to Sylvia now. I'll just, um, there you go, Sylvia. Thanks, Shereen. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. 
Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to talk to you about um, childcare. I've been in the industry for 20 years now. Um, I did start off as a primary teacher um, and um, then decided to then study my, what they call an ECT, an early childhood teacher um, as well, and also catered also for special ed, which is the special needs. But um, I then, we then decided husband and I decided to get into childcare, um, which has been amazing since um, we did start. Um, okay, so what is childcare? Childcare, it caters for children from six weeks to, um, to well, up to five years of age. Um, and they come in three different categories. I mean, a lot of childcare centres do have a different age groups, but um, I'll just give you the basics, which is your three groups, which is the zero to two, two to threes, three to fives. Um, and, and as a, a childcare worker, you need to be a great leader. You are a role model. You're actually, you have to be dedicated and also have some commitment. Um, also, you also have that opportunity to actually shape the young children that you have that you're actually teaching. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> Thanks, Sorry. Jane. Uh, I'm doing both, so yep, yeah, you go. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. That's um, right. Okay, a role of an early childhood teacher. Um, basically, an early childhood teacher is a vital role for, for all the little ones. So. So you've got the you've got your physical, your cognitive, your social, emotional development of children, um, and then we've also you, you as a teacher is a, you are a role model. Now, early childhood teaching, I think a lot of people probably think it's actually by babysitting, and it actually isn't babysitting. There's a lot involved. There's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, there's lots of programming, lots of um, observations of children, and this has to be done every six months. And then at the end as well, there's also like what you could, similar to like an, a, a yearly report, there's a portfolio that has to be handed in. All the staff have to, uh, you know, are given a child that they actually have to um, observe and write pretty much like a report, like it's more like a six monthly report. And we do also have a governing body, which we call, which is called a CEQA, which we, who are our bosses, which we have to actually abide by their rules. But that, I can talk about that later on. Okay, mm -hmm. um, qualifications. Um, basically, you minimum- Mom, no one from my class is here. Okay. No one from my class is here. That's all right, Christian, you can still okay. say. So um, the minimum say. qualifications would be um, what they call a certificate three. You can do that online. Um, I, as a childcare owner myself, I probably prefer to have people who have actually um, graduated from TAFE. If you are a certificate three, I just find that they come, they're a bit more equipped, they have more knowledge, more experience, and then you can move on to your diploma. If not, and you decide, okay, after you after school HSC, you decide that you want to go to uni and do what they call an ECT, which is the Bachelor of Early um, Childhood, which are in big demand. We can very, we rarely find those um, that kind of qualification. Um, that is probably the way to go. That I would say you would be getting a job just like that if you were to um, once you've graduated. You probably have a job even while you're actually at uni as well. Okay, um, so pretty much the career progression for childcare, as I said, you start off with Cert Three. You can then go on to your diploma, um, and through that. And obviously, through experience, you'll have um, you'll become a team leader. Then you can move up and move up to like a, a service leader or a nominated supervisor, childcare manager. And then, if you wanted to, and if you feel that you are able to run a business, you can then own a childcare centre, um, which I have. Um, so yeah, so that and which I think has just um, I think it you do find that having a childcare centre, yes, you have, you, you've got your issues with having staff and things like that, which is everywhere. Um, but I just find that at the end of the year, you realise, yes, you go through ups and downs, like in any, any job, but I just think at the end of it, the parents, you are family, you are their family, you are the one that is actually looking after their little precious one. Um, okay, um, finally, um, I'll probably just, um, why would you choose childcare? It is a rewarding experience. 
Um, you have the ability to watch the children and develop and watch them grow from six weeks. Um, and then you can move on to, you know, and also parents rely on you. They need you. You are an essential worker. And during COVID, this is one of the, the industries that has actually stayed open. Um, and I just find that it is, it is an essential part of, of life. You know, once you've had a family, you need us. Um, it is an exciting um, industry. We do, uh, there's lots of things happening, lots of, um, lots of regulation, sorry, lots of regulations, lots of things to learn, lots of professional development and, and through experience um, as well, you then become, like I said to you, you do become a leader and then you then start to teach others as they come through. If you have a passion for working with children and if teaching is your career, if is your calling and you simply just want, you wish to find a secure career, I would recommend being an early childhood teacher. I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you guys. Thank you. Um, I think we'll move to the next presentation. Again, we're going through them fast, but if you have questions, please put them up uh, for, for these guys. Um, let me check if Vragi is here. Um, let me just message him actually. What, what we might do, if you guys have any questions for Mina, Sherry um, and Sylvia, um, if you wanna share your questions, um, until we get the next speaker. Any questions at all? As I said, then I'll talk at once. Yeah, obviously, yeah. <laughs> no questions at all? Sure, guys. I think everyone's suffering Zoom fatigue after a, a term of uh, studying from home. It's the first day of school holidays. So, um, guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. I you're think we're sure punishing you them. You, you're sure you don't have any? If you don't have any questions, then Mina, Sherry, and Sylvia, you can yeah, um, you can leave. leave, and we can we can. Um, get and if there's them. any questions, you can just ask us later. Yeah, what we'll do is we'll send your details if you don't mind. Um, yep. If any of the kids want to. Uh, can I, um, can I send you my other email, not my department? Which email did you? Yeah, which uh, which email have you gone? We'll, we'll give them the phone number and they can WhatsApp you. Okay. Have any All right, yeah. Nice. Okay with yeah. you guys. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, That's okay. Fine. Thank you very much, guys. Nice. We appreciate you joining. Nice. Um, no worries. Okay. Next presentation yeah. we'll do is okay. Ragi, Bye. and he's right here. Um, so we'll. Um, Ruggie's just joining, and he's going to talk about. Uh, data analytics and actuarial studies. Uh, hey Rob? How's everyone? Um, so I'll share my screen quickly. Yeah, I, I've allowed anybody to share screen. Sure. And we're recording, Ragi, if that's okay. No problem. Cool. Um, so a little bit about myself you guys probably don't most of you probably wouldn't know who i am um so my name is ragi i work uh, i worked as a data data scientist and data data analyst for for quite a while so a little bit about data analytics then data, data analytics is actually quite a new field so um i myself got into the industry in around 2015 so around at that time there was only a single course in all of australia that was pure data analytics. Um, but since then, the, um, the industry has actually exploded. So it's easily one of the fastest growing um, careers in the world currently, um, and in Australia as well. Um, the pay is astronomical at the moment because of, A, the, the lack of resources that, that possess this skill set, um, and the kind of the mixture of skill sets that's required to become a like a proficient data scientist and we'll get to that in a little bit but um what i'll do is i'll actually tell you about some of the job opportunities first um hopefully get you guys excited and then we can go into you know what skill set do you need to become a data analyst or data data scientist um and then we can progress into how to get there through tertiary education so some of the career opportunities are really really 
exciting and really, really interesting. So things like self-driving cars, um, OCR, if you guys know what OCR is, so uh, optical character recognition. So for example, when your phone recognizes handwriting digits. Um, so using, using machines to detect cancers in MRIs and x-rays and things like that. Um, face recognition. Um, so, you know, every time you open your mobile phone with your face, that's using data analytics. Anomaly detection in financial, um, from a financial perspective. So things like fraud detection. Um, there is a huge applications in agriculture, for example. So, you know, uh, we had a, I had a friend of mine who I knew well, he built a robot to, be, to pick apples. Um, that was all using data science and data analytics. Um, there is a, a plethora of things. So, you know, with the explosion of technology, every piece of technology that you hold, that generates some sort of data. That data is then harnessed and the, the, the information that is taken out of there and used in something that is beneficial and the people that do that are data analysts and data scientists. So the applications for essentially are limitless. Um, it depends really on your interests and what domain you want to take your skill set in. So what kind of skill set do you kind of need to be, do you need to become a data scientist? So it's a bit of a kind of a unicorn because it is a mixture of a lot of different things. So you need a little bit of computer science because in essence, you are dealing with enormous amounts of data. So it's um, impossible to kind of go through it by eye or by hand. So you do need some sort of computer aided um, technology or software that will help you summarize the data, visualize it in a way that you are able to consume it as a, as a human. Um, you definitely need a, a quite a bit of mathematics. Um, again, because you are um, you know, concatenating data, which is essentially numbers. Um, you're breaking it down. You're trying to explain what is, you know, is this statistically significant or is these results just by, by chance, things like that. And obviously you need domain expertise. The domain expertise is not um, 100% required, particularly when you're starting. So say, for example, you're, you want to become, you know, you want to join a startup that's doing, you know, uh, X-ray image recognition to to diagnose cancer. You don't need to be a doctor. You don't need to be a radiologist. You will pick up the skill set as you work more and more in the field. But I would say the two that are very very important are computer, some sort of computer science or software engineering background, and a good working knowledge of mathematics. Um, so, how do you get there from a um, like educational perspective. So there is a couple of routes that you can take. Um, and there is probably one that I'm not showing you here, but I'll talk about it. So once you finish your HSC, you, you essentially have one or two options. Um, if you know that this is something that you really want to do, right? You can go via a STEM route. And STEM just stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So if you pick any STEM um, uh, um, course, such as, you know, just basic science, majoring in physics or mathematics or chemistry or where, whatever it may be, right? For, or engineering. Engineering is obviously excellent, particularly if you do something like software engineering or computer science. And then technology, of course, which is, you know, like IT or something like that, that's specialized. But essentially anything in STEM will give you the opportunity to then do one or two things. Um, if you do an engineering, so say, for example, software engineering, or IT, you can probably walk into a data analyst role. Um, or, however, if you are more focused around the actuary side, so at, for, for those of you who don't know what actuary is, actuary is essentially data analysis, but in a very specified, specialized field in finance and risk. So trying to assess risk. So uh, for example, when you take out an insurance policy, there is an actuarial model that runs in the background that says, what is the risk of this person and how much should we charge him to then offset that risk? Um, so if you if that's kind of your specialty, then that is, there is an actual Bachelor of Actuarial Sciences. But if you want just generic data, data analytics and particularly data science, um, you can do any STEM, so science, technology, engineering, or math. And then you can either get a 
a, a junior data analyst role, or if you do higher research, higher level research, such as a master's or a PhD, you can essentially walk into any data science role quite easily. Um, or you can go from a STEM into a what's called a um, higher education but by coursework. So yeah, I'm not sure if you guys know. So once you do an, a bachelor's, you have two options. You have the option to do research um, or you can do a master's by coursework, which is essentially the same as any other course, but it's just at a master's level. So there is still subjects and assignments and things like that. So I did one of those. I did a master's by coursework in data science. Okay. And then from then on, it's quite simple to get a, a data science um, a data science role or data analyst role. Um, there is obviously the other option, which I actually started off with, which I did something completely unrelated. So I started off in a, in a Bachelor of Pharmacy. And then from a Bachelor of Pharmacy, I went into a, a Master's of Data Science by coursework. And then that allowed me to then enter the field. So if, you know what I mean, you may not necessarily 100% know that you want to do this, but the good news is even if you don't, later down the track, if you decide that you want to, there is always a way back. The most important thing is that you do, you try to do very, very well in whatever course you start off with. And I'm, I'm talking in terms of marks, because then that will then give you the flexibility and the opportunity to then navigate and move around and things like that. If your marks are low, you're quite limited in what you can do. Um, in terms of pay, so the pay is can, can get extremely high. Um, so an entry level role as a data analyst, you're looking at around about 90 to 150,000. Um, and then as you progress from a data analyst to a data scientist, you can go um, all the way up to about $350,000 a year. Um, so it's quite lucrative. Um, it's very competitive though, because the role of a data scientist is extremely competitive. A lot of people want to become data scientists because A, it's extremely interesting. Uh, B, it's uh, very coveted, uh, and C, it's quite a senior position. Um, so you have to be quite good. So if you have a passion for this stuff, I strongly, strongly recommend that you follow it because it is a really, really interesting career. You, you can do a lot of interesting things and work with a lot of interesting people. Um, and if you have any questions at all, um, please feel free to email, message, call me, um, and I'm more than happy to kind of walk you through or talk you through any of this stuff a, a little bit deeper um, if this is something that interests you. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Raghi. Um, any questions for Raghi before we move to the next presentation? Yeah, I have a couple. Sure. Um, is there any difference between data science and data analytics, like in uni even? Yeah, good question. So they're kind of synonyms, but not really. So um, the field is data science, right? Uh, because it's like the science of extracting information from data, okay? But um, you become a data analyst. You start off as a data analyst and you eventually progress into a data scientist. So as I mentioned, data scientist is quite a senior role. Um, so it, it's pretty hard to go straight into a data scientist role unless you have higher, higher level uh, research, such as a PhD or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in essence, they're synonyms. So like a data, some people call it data analytics, some people call it data science. Um, and then under the umbrella of data science, there is multiple kind of facets. So there's machine learning, there's data engineering, um, there is uh, machine learning engineer, there's, uh, uh, you know, data architect, there's lots and lots of things that can kind of stem off that title of data, ana data analytics or data science. Okay. All right. Thanks. And one more, one more thing, right? You know how you were talking about, um, you can get into it like through the STEM courses and stuff? Yes. Um, like UNSW and like other unis, I don't really remember which they have um they have courses like literally called data science and analytics or data science and decisions or stuff like that that gets you in there as well right yes but as far as i understand 
as far as I know, that could have changed. They're usually postgraduate degrees. Uh, no, no, no. The, so the ones I'm talking about. Are okay, cool. Yeah, that must be very new. Um, mm. Yeah, that, yeah. If that if that exists, then that's absolutely fantastic. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Like uh, as I mentioned, when I kind of started down this path, there was a single course in all of Australia for data analytics. Um, and that was in Deakin University, and it was a postgraduate course. So now there will be a myriad, but um, I, I wasn't actually aware that there's undergraduate ones. But if there are, then that's perfect. That That's probably a route that I haven't included there, but that would probably be ideal. Yeah, yeah there's quite a few now. Thanks, Rogi. Fantastic. Any other questions for Rogi? Where's the required ATAR for data? Oh, that's, that's a very good question. Um, it would be uh, so mid to high 90s. Um, and there is usually a prerequisite of um, mathematics three unit. Um, so yeah, so that I, I would say it, it range it depends on the on the university. So the undergraduate one. So whereas a postgrad, um, if you're looking into a postgrad one, usually the the um, the requirement is just that you have a bachelor's degree. Um, and you, in that it was completed in Australia um, with, you know, a credit average or something like that. Any other questions for Rocky before he leaves us? I'll leave you in good hands. Okay, thank you, Rocky. And we, if you don't mind, we'll pass all your details to the kids. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, in case they have any questions, then they can come to you. And we're recording today, so we'll... We'll send it to everyone. Thank you very 100%. much, Rocky. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Okay. Next, uh, we've got Andrew. He's going to talk to us about IT. Andrew, do you want to start? Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, very exciting times, uh, thinking can about career choices. You can share the screen up. Uh, enable that if you want. Yeah. Let me know when you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see that. Okay, beautiful. So just quickly, um, wanted to talk about careers in information technology. And there's probably no discipline that's kind of wider in terms of scope than information technology. So if we kind of think a little bit about the interactions we have in our daily lives, if, you, if you're using a mobile phone, if you jump on a video call, if you use a computer, if you surf the internet, if you use software like Microsoft Office or Google Classroom, if you walk up to an ATM to withdraw some cash, if you've saved anything onto the cloud, you've interacted with information technology somehow. So it's, it's very prevalent in everyday life. So if you were to really summarize it down to what it truly is though, information technology is really around the storing, organizing, moving and using of data or information with the help of either hardware or software and sometimes both. This is then used to allow biz businesses and people to make quick and informed decisions, facilitate the information or sharing of information or knowledge, or connect people across the world on a social level or a professional level, social level, for example, on, on you know, your Facebooks and LinkedIn's and that kind of stuff. And on a professional level, like we are now on Zoom, Google Meets, conference calls, etc. And then finally, to complete transactions. So when, when I send you some money via my mobile banking, I'm using information technology because I'm not sending you physical money. I'm authorizing that my bank sends you what's in my balance, which is stored in a database somewhere as information. And that is being transferred from my balance in the database to your balance in the database. But the transaction is complete. I'm actually sending you money without a transaction ever completing. So information has actually taken away the need for lots of things that used to be done in the physical world. They can be done now in the digital or information world. There are lots of different career paths and there's lots of things to be done to make sure the world runs from an information technology perspective, whether it's your network engineer who designs your routers and Wi-Fi's and allows you to log onto the internet, whether it's your security engineers who keep the data safe and make sure the bad guys can't access things they can't access, whether it's the designers who are designing the software you interact with, 
every little cool app you've ever used. And there's been someone there mocking up every single screen, coming up with how it works and how to make it easier for you. Whether it's the program managers or project managers who put together the end-to-end -end process of how software goes from an idea to being built towards being put in the consumer's hand. There's lots of different jobs involved and they all require different skills. And that's why it's probably the most varied um, job sort of family out there in the industry. How do you get into it through uni or TAFE? There are lots of choices and by no means is this list complete. But if you're a very smart person who is very good with maths, very good with numbers, very good with logic, have ever explored writing code before, I highly recommend software engineering. This means that typically software engineers are people who want to sit and focus and kind of build stuff that works and test it and make sure it works and get, get the excitement out of writing some code and seeing that that code performs a task. Um, computer science is a bit more of a, an open sort of um, kind of course that gets you across the entire industry in its entirety, but it helps you understand how everything fits together from a systems perspective. And it gives you the option to work broader across the, the information technology spectrum. Business analytics, I'm sure Raghi would have mentioned a little bit about the analytics part, but business analytics is a bit more specialized in that it looks for how we use data to make business decisions. So how do we take data from different places, string it together to sort of just understand how things impact each other and how to do some sort of you know, A-B testing or um, to, I'm not sure if, if, if A-B testing makes sense for you guys, but how do we kind of grab the customer segments in a business, break it up into smaller segments and say this segment is going to get an offer, this segment's not going to get an offer, how are they going to perform and respond to the particular offering and is that going to be good for business or not? The, the guys that do all these forms of tests are typically people who are analytics people and they're typically analytics people who are a bit more business-minded. Um, and that's what this cohort is about. The interactive computing, this is really around how do we kind of make computer interactions fun? How do we use them in media and how do we use them to deliver information either from an entertainment perspective or from a gaming perspective? And then finally, computer engineering, which is really around the hardware side of things, the actual devices that we use to access this information and interact with it. From a TAFE perspective, um, there are lots of courses at TAFE as well, and most of them are under the banner of information and communications technology. But then within that, there are a whole heap of specializations that you can choose from, whether it's backend database design, whether it's project management, IT security, networking, etc. Lots of different um, options. If you want to think about the spectrum of um, kind of uni kind of um, results, or sorry, HSC results you need to achieve. You're looking across most of these disciplines sitting above the 90 ATAR mark. Um, and when you start looking at things like, um, you know, the software engineering courses and computer engineering courses, they're a bit further towards the upper side of the 90s. Um, and then when you, when you look at some, some of the options available, like computer science, if, you're, if you want to get some sort of sponsored program, UTS and New South Wales universities both have Bachelor of ITs and they're sponsored courses. So if you get into those ones, you're actually getting paid while you study and you're guaranteed a job out of university, but the cutoffs there are, you know, up at 99%. So, you know, and, and you've got to go through a few interviews, et cetera. But if you can get into a course like that, you're pretty set. The salary ranges, it can really, do, it does really range, but the beginner salary is kind of quite healthy to begin with. When you think of the average income here in Australia at the moment is, sitting between about 70 to 80K in a household at the moment, the beginner salary for this industry is already at that average earning level in Australia. So you're starting off with a, from a pretty good starting point. And the thing is, as the salaries grow over time, there is actually no cap. Once you make it to executive levels, it really does depend on the size of the organization you work in. So for example, an executive running a, I'll talk about product management because that's my specialty. Um, an executive running product management in a small company will be earning around that 250K mark. In a mid-sized company, we'll be earning you know, 350 to 400. And then in a large corporate, there's, there's really no limit. Um, I, I worked a long time at Westpac and our kind of executives back then 
were earning, you know, between 500 to a million dollars a year, depending on how long they've been around for. So the, the opportunity and the upside here is kind of endless, but it does come at a cost and we're going to talk about it on, on the next slide. And the next slide really does really tell you about the advantages. Lots of different options and, and you can work remotely or internationally and, and the skill set is very transferable. If you do the job here in Australia and you go somewhere else, you don't need re-accreditation. You hit the ground running because it's kind of pretty uniform in terms of how things work. The pay is very strong. Uh, some work environments are really fun. Um, you know, I, I've worked a long time in corporate and most recently I've stepped down to work in kind of startup companies like smaller companies and I've really enjoyed those environments. I felt that, you know, you can work as a sort of team of three, four people, you gather around a whiteboard and you can start sort of ideating things and working out what you can and can't do. And it's really fun and you build that really good camaraderie with your, with your teams because you are working so close together. Some of the disadvantages though, um, it is very competitive. Um, not, not every product succeeds. A lot of products don't succeed. So you might work on lots of things that don't go anywhere. It can be disheartening to some people that, that feel like failure is um, kind of not to be tolerated. But again, over time, you, you learn that you've got to just keep trying and eventually one thing that you produce is going to be amazing. Um, the hours can be quite long um, and the demands can be quite long because of the competition in the market. You know, you build something great and you're winning in the market and customers are coming and your product is loved, but all of a sudden a new competitor comes in or someone just replicates what you've done, but then gives the customer a bit more. So now you've got to kind of just go again and kind of just stay on your toes. So the hours can be quite demanding. Um, however, uh, I've seen most recently that a lot more companies and industries are going to better work-life balance, which is, which is good, but it's only just starting now and maybe COVID has been the trigger for businesses to focus on the well-being of their people a little bit more and just be mindful of the amount of hours that we're asking people to work. And then finally, the work itself is complex. <laughs> it's very complex. Um, you know, solving problems that haven't been solved before, they haven't been solved before because they're complex. And every new idea, every new product that goes to market, every new app, every new system, every new device has solved the problem that hasn't been solved before. And because they haven't been solved before, they are complex. And you're trying things for the first time. Some will work, some won't work. Some will work and then you get some more feedback from your customers and you've got to go again and make more changes to it and respond and see if the iteration now makes a difference. And you've just got to keep on your toes. So they're the disadvantages of the work, which in their own right, you can, if you're a person who loves a real challenge, you can use that to your advantage and see if you can, give yourself that kind of constant uh, fuel to go again and try harder and make things work. That's, um, that's pretty much it from what I had to present. I wanted to sort of just give it back to you guys to sort of, um, yeah, ask any questions that you may have. I know that I went through the slides really quickly because they are quite straightforward and many you're welcome to share them with, with the guys if, if you like, but I'm happy to take a few questions if, um, if anyone has some. Any questions for Andrew? Uh, there's a question online. How has outsourcing affected the IT industry? Uh, good question. Uh, it, it really hasn't. Um, um, I would say when it initially started, people were a little bit skeptical. People were worried that their own jobs would be outsourced overseas. The reality of it, there is more work that needs to be done in Australia than the people we have available. And hence the outsourcing has been used to plug the resource gap that we have here in Australia. And it hasn't really affected anyone I've seen from being able to find a job. Thank you, Andrew. Any other questions, guys? I think I'm getting off lightly. Okay, well, we'll pass your details as well, um, Andrew, to others that couldn't make it today so that at least they we've recorded it and then they can listen and um, if they have any questions, they can come.